Okay, I think we're going live, except for on Instagram where you have to do an extra step. So just doing that right now. Hi, anyone who's joining us today. We're so excited that you're here. Okay, here we go. Go live on Instagram. There we go. Okay, I'm just going to double check that we're showing live on Facebook. Sounds great. Um, we have such dreary weather here today in Texas. What is your, what is your weather looking like? Well, it was very windy. Now the sun's coming up, so it's getting a little better. It's been raining the past couple of days. Yeah, yeah. We, we're getting some rain too, but it's much, much needed. <laughs> um, All over the world, it's needed, so <laughs> we should never yeah. be upset about rain. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. All right. Well, welcome, welcome to Fairy Tale Flip. I believe this is our episode five, um, our fourth episode together, but um, episode five of Fairy Tale Flip. I'm Vanessa Y. Rogers, and uh, my co host is Donna Lee Fields from Doorways to Learning. That's her podcast, but she also has Scaffolding Magic, uh, which is her business. And uh, you can find her, that website. It's just www.scaffoldingmagic.com, right? Yes. Yes. Um, and then I also have a podcast, Fabric of Folklore, where I talk about uh, folklore and the hidden meaning behind uh, folk tales, fairy tales, language. It's a little bit more broader than wh what we do here on Fairy Tale Flip. But I love that we are collaborating on this podcast on Fairy Tale Flip because it's, for one thing, it's so fun. We're talking about fairy tales, and fairy tales are just, you know, Everybody knows fairy tales, right? They're exciting. They're um, they are close to home for a lot of people. Yeah, fairy tales are a way for us to sort of um, vent our angst about society in in really kind of uh, benign ways. So it's really fairy tales have been like this for centuries. Ways for the peasants, the villagers, the common people to complain about the nobility and still keep their head on their shoulders. So yeah, fairy tales are magical. I love them. Yeah. And last uh, month we did Rumpelstiltskin, which I found really amazing because I didn't realize how old of a story it was. I didn't realize it was one of the oldest Western literature sto stories of all time, that it's older than the New Testament. That was really amazing to me. So I just love that all the things that we learn through doing a uh, fairy tale flip. And why don't we talk a little bit about, so our structure is usually we give our audience three options to choose from. And this month we chose one that was suggested by the uh, an audience member who participated last time, the girl who trod on a loaf, which was super fascinating. I never heard of that one. Um, and that was the one I actually voted for. And then one that you really wanted to do, the wild swans. The Wild Swans, also by Hans Christian Andersen, which was very interesting because I didn't, I never heard about the girl who trod on a loaf. It, it's an interesting fairy tale. Uh, tale. I happen to like The Wild Swans because I've read it in a lot of different versions. So mm -hmm. that was one I voted for. And my aunt uh, was actually also said that she read that story to her. Um, she was a kindergarten teacher and she read that that story to her kindergarten children quite a bit. So she really liked that story as well. Um, and I never heard of the, the wild swans either. So mm -hmm. that was really interesting as well. But the one that the audience ended up voting for um, is not actually a technical fairy tale, but we're going to get into that a little bit. Um, it's uh, the legend of Popocatepetl and is Taxiwatl. Um, it's a legend that comes from Mexico. Um, so why don't you give us a little bit of a synopsis of this legend, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you pronounce it so well. I'm so impressed. Um, there is actually a way we can shorten it. The nicknames are Popo and Icha. So that's what I'm yeah. going for, Vanessa. If you could, okay. If Popo and Icha. One. Okay. Yeah. I am gonna. I'm. I am gonna give a little pronunciation lesson. I. I hope that it's a correct one. But this is the one I. I um, read over and over to kind of get that pronunciation. Yeah, because it's not actually Spanish, it's it's Aztec. So, you know, wherever you got the pronunciation from, I, again, very impressive. You really love research <laughs> and, and it pays off. Yeah. 
All right, so let me just, a very short synopsis because Vanessa said we have a YouTube video on her channel and on my channel of Vanessa reading this legend and she does it so well. The summary really is very simple. The Aztecs were ruling the area known now as Mexico for centuries and there were tribes that didn't like their rule. And one of them was um, this tribe where one of the warriors was named Popo and he wanted to marry the princess, the daughter of the ruler. And the ruler said, that's fine. As long as you go to war against the Aztecs, you win and then come back and you can have the hand of, of my daughter. She wanted it. Um, so he went. The problem is that someone else liked the princess and lied to her and told her that her lover, Popo, had died in war. She actually died of grief. Um, Popo came back victorious, but he found out that his love of all time had died, carried her up into a mountain, um, and then sat with her until he actually turned to stone as well. Or I think he turned to ash, Vanessa, you'll have to correct me on that one. And they both became, they each became a volcano. And that's where the yeah. legend is. Yeah, I am going to make one correction. And it's uh, because when I first read it multiple times and the way I read it on the, my YouTube channel, I read it wrong. Um, I said that the warrior and um, the princess were from the rebellious tribe, but they were actually from the emperor. So um, I, so I, I do need to make a correction on my YouTube channel as well, because I believe I, when I read it the first couple of times, that's how I read it. And then I realized that it, it was the emperor's daughter um, because I read a longer version. There are several different versions um, of this story, but the longer version talks about how the emperor and his wife are, uh, are have been trying for a child for a really long time, and the their people really want them to have a child, and eventually she ends up having this um, daughter, is Tatsuwatl, and you're calling her Itcha? Is that how you're saying it? Her name yeah, but that's my pronunciation. It's very possible yeah. that in Mexico they do it differently. Who knows? Well, that's that name in particular. I found different different pronunciations. So that one, I'm not pr positive how that um, the people there pronounce it. But I I, I found multiple different definitions uh, pronunciations. So that one was a little bit more confusing. Um, so yeah, it was the emperor's warrior and the emperor's daughter. Um, so yeah, but that was a great um rundown of the story and um but so before we get into the uh you know what we what we got from it I, i'm going to give a little bit of a pronunciation lesson for anyone who's interested because i i i thought it was really uh once you get the the name especially the warrior's name is really fun to say i've been like going around the house and just saying popoca tepetal popoca tepetal popoca tepetal because it just like rolls off the tongue and it makes me really like curious about their language and because it sounds very sing-songy um it has seven syllables which is one reason why it's so hard to say. Um, so I pictured it, I'm not very good with languages, so I have to break it up in my own way. I um, I said Pope, like the Pope who lives in the Vatican, and then add an A, Popa, Kata, Kata Petal, like a petal, like a flower petal. So Popa, Kata, Petal, Popa, Kata, Petal. Um, it, it flows a little bit differently than how I, I broke it up. Um, and then is tux, it was, um, is Tuxi Waddle, is Tuxi Waddle, um, is the princess's name. And that's the full name. But you're right that they, a lot of people just call them by their nicknames because they are very long and arduous. <laughs> Yeah, but it's nice. So now, thank you so much for that. That makes it much more doable. And then the next thing I, I, you're probably going to go into is the point of this podcast, the reason we both love it so much is that we love to read and find and discover the hidden meanings. And because mm -hmm. the legend is a little different. So I think it would behoove us to first distinguish between a fairy tale and a legend and so that our listeners understand the hidden meanings are not necessarily going to be in the story, but rather the connection to the story and where the legend was told. Mm -hmm. So would you yeah. like to, would you like to give your definition and your distinction and I'll give mine afterwards? Sure. Yeah. And it's interesting because, um, you know, when I describe what folklore is, oh, I'm just realizing my light's not on me. Um, <laughs> when I <laughs> describe what folklore is, uh, 
and I went to the American Folklore Society when I was originally trying to figure out for my podcast, every folklorist has a different definition. So the same is true for a lot of these different genres. So it's, you know, I think of folklore a lot of as like a ball of yarn and it's all kind of intertwined and twisted together. So it's sometimes hard to distinguish between the different lines. But my understanding is a fairy tale is generally written by an author. Um, it gets a little confusing because we classify the Grimm's Brothers fairy tales as fairy tales, but really they were oral tales told over and over again. And then the Grimm's brother wrote them, the Grimm's brothers wrote them down. So they are actually classified as folk tales because although they were written down by the Grimm's brothers, they were not imaginated. They weren't uh, <laughs> imagined by those brothers. Um, but Hans Christian Andersen is one of the most more famous of the European fairy tale authors, um, which is why we had the, the Wild Swans and The Girl Who Trod on the Loaf. They were both written by him. Um, and I'm not sure if he got any of his ideas from folk tales himself, but it's, it's very likely that he pulled from folk tales. Um, so generally, fairy tales have a supernatural element. They are not rooted to a time and place. They start with once upon a time in American, at least in um, English, uh, but they have a, a very uh, strict structure. Once upon a time, they lived happily ever after. There's some magic elements that happen in the middle. There's um, archetypes. Uh, there's a villain. There's a protagonist. And uh, those are the main characteristics of a fairy tale versus uh, a folk tale, for instance. Whereas and if you, a and Vanessa, if you don't mind, I'm just going to interrupt you for one second because it's a really important point that you probably already know, but you're not saying in this moment is that the mm -hmm. fairy tales written down by the Grimm's were actually written in such a way that the parents could then tell the story to their children, even though they were still pretty gruesome, before mm -hmm. the Grimm's wrote down the fairy tales, they were really only told from adult to adult. And again, mm -hmm. it was a social statement. The Grimm's wrote it down in such a way that they were um, a little more adapted to the to children. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And now you know, they're becoming a little more. And we, we need to talk about, we need to spend one whole session on how much we're going to protect children from the realities of life. We've been touching on that <laughs> subject, but I yeah. still have more ideas. So then legends. So a legend is rooted to a time and a place. So this story in particular, it is takes place in during the time of the Aztecs. Whereas you if you think about Rumpelstiltskin, it's once upon a time in a place far, far away. We don't know where this place is. We don't know when it is, right? But we know when the Aztecs lived. They lived for a, a couple hundred years in in a very, uh, in central Mexico, right? So there is a time and a place it has, it's rooted. Um, and usually a, a legend has a character or a place that is true, a, a real Something that's an element of truth, a grain of truth, if you will. If you think or American, even a natural occurrence, which is what this this one is about. So yeah, right. The geography, right? Because right. the volcanoes in the area are named for these characters, or the other way around, right? The the, the legend comes from the names of the, the um, volcanoes. But yes, um, yeah. So that's kind of the difference. Uh, the, a legend has some truth, like Paul Bunyan, for instance, was likely based off of an actual lumberjack. Um, they think that it was based off of a French lumberjack who was six feet tall and had really large hands, but six feet tall at the time because of malnutrition was actually very tall. He wasn't a giant like, you know, what we have in our in our stories, but he was tall in comparison to the five feet men who were working at the time. Right. And then we also have myths and we're not going to talk too much about myths right now, but we have fairy tales, we have legends and myths and myths are also tied to natural, more natural disasters than legends. Legends, are, like you're saying, they're rooted in a geographic area, but a myth, for instance, and I'd love to get into the Greek myth sometime, um, mm -hmm. Vanessa. So for instance, Phaeton is actually the story, the Greek myth about Phaeton and the, the horse that touches the sun and the sun comes, sorry, I'm, I'm mixing them up, but when the sun comes down, it's, it's about a comet. It's a comet that actually hit the earth I think 12,000 mm -hmm. years ago, which is also tied to the fall of Atlantis. So all of these have really interesting ties. Yeah. So, so I like to describe mythology as the narrative of a religion. 
So it, uh -huh. there's always a deity that's involved with um, a mythology. So you're absolutely this, right. You're absolutely right. It's connected to a religion and also a natural phenomenon. So perfect. Yeah. Um, and and the, actually the natural phenomenon is now being proven. These phenomena are being proven by scientists, by archaeologists, by um, other scientists <laughs> that are studying <laughs> geography. geography. Okay. So yeah. um, let's. This is a legend. So I don't know about you, but I didn't find really deep meanings in the legend itself, in the story itself. But what I found was the tie to the whole spirit of the people who live in the area now known as Mexico, where it's the sort of undying um, celebration of life, no matter what happens. So how about if we start there? What do you think? Yeah, I, I would love to hear what your initial thoughts were. And, and, um, anyone who is with us right now, please comment down below where you're watching and listening from. And also uh, what your initial thoughts were when you when you read it or had you already been famili familiar with it? What what came to the surface for you? And so Donna, the same question, um, what came to the surface for you when you when you read this story? Well, you know, some people like to say it was um, um, Latin America, Romeo and Juliet, which really isn't very accurate. And I think you'll agree with this because in Romeo and Juliet, she fakes her death. And then Romeo um, thinks that she is dead when in this legend, she actually did die. So there's some parallels, but not mm -hmm. that many. This one really for me had to do with the volcanoes. And I really connected mm -hmm. the whole idea with the, the, erupting passions between these two people who truly loved each other, according to the legend. I don't know them. I don't, I don't know them now. Um, and the relationship to the volcanoes where one is active to this day and the other one is not. And the locals there will point out all of the features of the princess lying there on, on her, what is now considered her tomb. So for me, it was the volcanoes. And so I did a lot of research on the spiritual meaning of volcanoes and we oh, can go there. Yes. I'd love to hear what you, what you found. <laughs> well, <laughs> it doesn't go as deep as I wish it did, but mm -hmm. there are a lot of cultural belief systems about uh, volcanoes and eruptions can be seen as personal and spiritual transformation. So what I'd like you to do Vanessa is, you know, when you're listening yeah. to this and our listeners as well, when I'm saying this, what, bring what do these ideas bring up for you if i say that a volcano eruption can be seen as a personal and spiritual transformation does that have any ties to the story itself when we're watching a volcano erupt which can be seen because one of these volcanoes is still active mm -hmm. it's like a spiritual awakening the earth in my belief system vanessa i'm not sure about you in my belief system the earth is actually a sentient being and so the mm. volcanoes are one way that it's a very visible way that she's coming alive. Sometimes mm. she's a little more dormant, sometimes a little more active. And mm -hmm. people say that if you sit by a volcano and meditate in front of it, you can harness the power of the volcano and you mm. will experience personal growth. So it's embracing mm -hmm. nature's power. What do you think? Well, and I also, I, I think that a volcano really illustrates how much nature is in control of this planet. Um, it, you know, a lot of times humans, we feel like we we control everything. But when nature, uh, like volcanoes and hurricanes and tornadoes uh, come to come to fruition they really show us that oh no oh no you're not in control at all this this planet has an opinion and um and we're here and it's important that you acknowledge our, our presence and so i um i think that there's something to that spiritual awakening um but i also think you know the i'm curious um you know because it the the volcano sits right over or near Mexico city and it's an active volcano, but has it spewed? Do, did you look at, at that at all? I didn't, I didn't find um, that it had actually like erupted with a lava flow at all. 
within any I don't know. recent. Yeah, I'm not sure how far the lava goes. I just know that there are climbers that climb up to the top and they only can go during certain seasons. So it oh, regularly okay. does erupt. And I'm not sure if it's just the smoke or if the lava comes out, but they don't go up when it's being becoming more active. Well, the one that is named for the woman, and she's sometimes called the white woman because she's covered. She's right. always covered in snow, and sometimes she's called the sleeping woman um, because she's lying down. And if you look at the structure you were mentioning, um, it, it looks like um, her head and her knees and her feet. Uh, so it, it looks like someone is, uh, you know, sleeping there. Um, but she, that one is, has been dormant since the 1800s. So that one is. People, a lot of adventurers like to go hike that mountain for sure. Um, but I didn't know that anyone was hiking Popocatepetl. Um, yeah. And they say it's not a really fun climb because it's a lot of broken rocks, but they do it because it's, it's famous. Mm -hmm. um, then there's, you know, just to, to can finish with what I understand about the symbolism of a volcano is that there's that dual nature where the volcano can be destructive, but it also signif signifies um, birth and renewal. So it's kind of fascinating because we have the death of this couple mm -hmm. that actually gives life because a mountain gives life. If we're talking about a sentient being of the planet, Mm -hmm. Even if it's a volcano, there are trees and there are plants on both mountains. And so there was new life created, not human life, but mm -hmm. life nevertheless. And then you have to decide, what do you recognize as life? Mm -hmm. um, and then we're going to go really deep, Vanessa, because really, I believe rocks are sentient beings as well, but at a very low vibration. So mm. there's a lot of life going on in these two volcanoes that you may mm -hmm. or may not recognize. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So <clears throat> one of the things that I that came up for me was one of the stories that we did not choose. Uh, the donkey, the donkey skin. What was that? What, what, what yeah, it was the called? donkey skin. Yep. The donkey skin. Um, the prince in that story as well nearly died of grief, and you know you see this multiple times throughout fairy tales that people die of grief and you know in in today's world you see that more with um older couples like if a, a couple has been together for decades and the husband dies the wife will not live for very much longer because her heart is is breaking and you'll say people will say she died of of grief and i and i i find that really I, I, that's believable to me, but it isn't believable to me for, for someone so young to die of grief. And maybe I'm wrong. If, if you, if you're a listener and you, if you know of a story of someone who, who died of grief, grief from a young age, I would love to hear it or at least got sick. But that was, is really interesting to me. And I, it makes me curious, um, about if, she caught something or like what what actually happened although i didn't find any evidence that these were true people did you find any evidence that they were they were people who actually lived in none of my research did, it, did i find that they were real people however it's very possible they were but again it's just really a metaphor for mm -hmm. what i actually wanted to go into and you just brought it up is how far do we go with our familial ties, with our ties, um, when we feel so much passion towards someone, how far mm -hmm. do we go with our own life essence to connect to that person? And connecting is exactly what you're talking about. You, di She died of grief. Mm -hmm. He essentially died of grief as well. Is mm -hmm. that something that we want to emulate? Is that something that we want to propagate? Mm -hmm. What, what is our, what, responsibility do we have to our emotions and to the people around us? Mm -hmm. And you, you brought up Romeo and Juliet and their parallels and they're not the exact story, but I was curious about that as well. And I s found that there are multiple, this is a very common theme throughout different cultures. So this story, Romeo and Juliet, the Persian tale of Layla and Maj. Majunan, I'm not sure how to say the last name, the Chinese legend of the butterfly lovers. So this is the common story that is told, is uh, heard around the world in different cultures um, of young loves 
dying of of grief of love sickness um and so you know this is not just isolated to one story so it is it is very interesting um that it is told and obviously it's not something we want our children to be dying of we don't want them to die of heartbreak and love sickness um but i do think that there is some truth in that especially in young love are are it's hard to have perspective, right? A lot of times we we have a narrow minded of this is what our life is right now and it will never be any better. And I think especially with when you're young, it's harder to see the, the larger picture that, you know, better things are coming as well. Right. And the funny thing is, especially since the artwork is very much modern, I'm, I think you saw a lot of the artwork looks um like what you find on social media today. And the, mm -hmm. and the story really is this whole drama about what you'd find on social media and teenagers and 20 year olds are gonna think, oh yes, oh, how how lovely that he felt so strongly about her that he built a mountain for her because he really did, he built a mountain and he died for her. And mm -hmm. so we need to think about whether the story was told why the story was told. Was it simply to explain why there is one volcano next to another and one of them is active and others not? Or was it told because of, in the Mexican culture, what is now the Mexican culture, is fa our family ties so important that you need to die for the other person? That's something I can't answer, even though I'm pretty immersed in the Latin, in the Latin American and, and in the Spanish culture. It doesn't go that far usually. But mm -hmm. with social media, unfortunately, things can start snowballing and, and these kids will get the wrong message. So mm -hmm. what responsibility do we have? What did you learn about the Aztec afterlife? I don't think I researched that at all. Did you research that? I'm curious. Oh, if no. <laughs> okay. Well, because I'm, I'm, I'm wondering because, you know, the Aztecs, one of the things that I didn't know a whole lot about the Aztecs prior to doing research for this um this legend and the one thing that i did know was that the aztecs had a calendar that is uh <laughs> that predicts the end of time evidently but that the, the end of time obviously didn't end up coming um <laughs> and then that they were big into human sacrifice and so i wonder how their how they feel about what happens after death and because they had a lot of death in their rituals, right? And one of the things that I learned was that they generally didn't live past 37. That that was the average lifespan, at least. And so they they didn't live a whole a, a long time. So I don't know. I um I do know it, some of it. I do know some of it. When I was saying, oh no, it means that I actually do know a little bit about it. And people who are experts on Aztecs, I welcome them to correct me if I'm wrong. But what I do understand, because I've been following someone who has been talking a lot about the pyramids and what he was saying, he says about the pyramids, that they were actually connected to pyramids all over the world. And the Aztecs were one of the people that were connected to the population in Chem, which is now known as Egypt. I'm getting to the whole point, but is now known as oh, Egypt. Yeah. And these people were actually the people who lived in, um, uh, what did I just say? The, uh, the fall of the, the fall of the, I'll get it. Anyway, the pyramids actually connected people all over the world. And what they knew at that time is that death is an absolute natural part of life, but there, mm -hmm. that we live millions of different carnations. And so at that time, from my understanding, they were not so fearful of death. They knew by the, when they were born, Ad, um, Atlantis, sorry, that's what I was trying to get to. Oh, in Atlantis, okay. they were taught, and I believe this is in the Aztecs also, they were taught at the day of birth that you say one more day until you die. And so they were taught that death is so much a part of life that it was just accepted. Does that mean that you go up on top of a mountain and die with your lover? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But the, the view of death is not as taboo as it is in, for instance, the Western culture. I think we need to have more discussion about death in the Western culture. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I had a guest come on um, and talk. She lives in Mexico and she talked a lot about how the funeral process is 
in it starts out in in the loved one's home and so people come to the home and it's just much more up in front and people are more willing to have conversations about it because it's closer to home whereas in american culture in particular we kind of um you know we send the body away and it's taken care of by other people and it's a lot more uh, distance and so we have more of a fear of of death and also we don't like talking about it as well um <laughs> so I, I i definitely think that there is value in in looking at how other people uh, look at death i absolutely agree i mean i was reading i read a lot of stories about legends let's say scandinavians and in scandinavia they're very open about it they talk very openly that this is where i want to be buried or this is where i want to be my ashes to be thrown and after i die this is what i'd like you to do with my things and so it's a from what i understand a very constant conversation and as you say in the united states it you you don't talk about it I started talking about it with my siblings just because things like this are coming up and I want them to know I'm not mm -hmm. scared of it. I believe that we are, we just transform into different energy. And I believe this is what the Aztecs felt as well. We simply mm -hmm. transform into different energy. And so we're here, but with these eyes, with the eyes of a human body, we don't see the people that have trans transitioned into different energy. Mm -hmm. um, and when you were saying about the average lifespan, about the Aztecs, that was for all over the world. Before penicillin mm -hmm. was invented, people did not live very long. Penicillin mm -hmm. at least doubled our lifetime, our lifespans. So, but it's interesting that you know mm -hmm. that. I really like to have that fact. Yeah. So did you find any other versions of this story that you found interesting? I didn't find any versions because just as what we were saying, these legends have to do with an historical event. Um, and in this case, geographical volcanoes, you know, a location. Mm -hmm. So there weren't other versions of it that I found. Um, did you find anything? I did. Yeah, there was one I particularly like. So one of them, this instead of it being a jealous uh, rival, the soldiers actually believed that uh, Popo had died. They uh, believed yeah. that he had died okay. on, on the, the field. And so the emperor told his, his daughter um, with like, he, he had a piece of his armor and he had evidence that he had died, but the soldiers were just mistaken about his death. Um, and then there was obviously the one that we told with the jealous rival. And then there was another one that went further with that same jealous rival um, and they threw rocks at each other, creating the volcano along the divide. Um, they evidently, at this story, Popo and Isha married one another. Um, and uh, the rival really was still in love with the princess. And so they had a, a fight with these giant rocks and it created the Rocky Mountain ranges of the continental divide and the trans Mexican volcanic belt that lie between the two mountains. Um, and then the Pocatepetl burst into flame. He flung an enormous chunk of ice and decapitated the volcano or the mountain that's called Nevado de Toluca. And that is why Nevado is flat topped with wide shoulders, but no head. And conceivably this legend preserves the memory of the catastrophic eruptions and so i i really like that one because it that one describes even more the entire geographical area that those volcanoes are in i thought that was really fun yeah that's interesting because i did see um a different ending i didn't go i didn't find one that said that they actually married i love the fact that they actually married but mm -hmm. still it's not really a harmonious ending um <laughs> and then the other thing that maybe that our listeners might find interesting is if we're going to go back to the fact that the planet is a sentient being, if you believe that or want to consider it, then the volcanoes that you're talking about, that whole range of volcanoes, if you look at a map, they're followed from the very south of, the, of Argentina all the way up to, Antarctica, to the North Pole. And that is the spine of the Earth. Oh, so, Really, I look, didn't I'll, realize I'll, that. 
Yeah, it's really interesting because there's a very short video that I, I'm going to send you the link so that we can include it in the show notes that shows okay. the different ways that Earth, the planet Earth, really has all the organs that a human body has. If you look at Africa and South America, they're the lungs, the, all the water is considered the blood, the heart, the head chakra is at the North Pole, a little south of what we consider the North Pole because the Earth is on an axis, et cetera, et cetera. And these whole line of volcanoes are considered part of the, the spine of the earth. And so, you know, this legend actually supports not only the country Mexico, it supports it as its resilience, you know, their spirit of resilience, but perhaps it also is, it's so lasting that it gives everyone else hope that when you love enough, you can, mm -hmm. you, you keep going. Yeah. A nice thought, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, did you learn anything about the Aztecs as you were going in your research that you thought were, was interesting to share? Tell me what you found. Okay, well, these are the things I found. Okay, so they lived between, so it, it existed between 1300 AD and 1521 um, in uh, central Mexico. Um, it At its peak, it had 15 million people in within the empire um the language that we were talking about that the aztecs spoke was called um na nahuatl nahuatl i nahuatl, believe is, yep. mm -hmm. yeah. um, and we actually have words from the nahuatl language in the english language and it's still spoken today in mexico by about one one and a half million people and spanish speakers a lot of Spanish speakers don't realize that there are lots of Spanish words are taken from the Nahuatl language. Um, but the ones that we have in English are, for once, Mexico. Mexico is a Nahuatl word based off of um, where the an initial city was built in the lake of the moon. And Mexico means the, the center of the moon. Um, and uh, avocado comes from a Nahuatl word. Chocolate, tomato, and chili are all words that um, we take from the, from the Aztecs. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, they, the Aztecs were the first people to discover chocolate, although they didn't have sugar. So they, they ate it, and it was quite bitter. Um, but they believed that the chocolate beans came from the gods, and they used it as a currency. Um, so it was very important to them. And they were... Their sophistication in engineering was really incredible. Um, they highly, they had an aqua system that was much better than the one that the Europeans had at the time, and they were more, much more sanitary. They took baths on a daily basis, and they had a way to have clean water rather than I think the Europeans struggled a lot with keeping their their water systems clean, and so they they had a lot of plagues that were that dealt with, you know, the unclean water, but the Aztecs had much cleaner water. Um, another thing that I found really interesting was they talked about how the rebel tribe that it was, I think they, they call them city states, the rebel group that went to war with the emperor. Um, they did so because they didn't like the taxation. And I don't know if you looked into this at all, but I was really curious about this. And I learned that there, the Aztecs were really um, had in inequalities, like severe inequalities. They their inequalities were more severe than they are today in Mexican society. Um, and if you were a rebel group that fought against the Aztecs instead of just bowed to them and said, "Okay, we will join you," um, your taxations were higher. And so sometimes the Aztecs would just like just like say, no, you have to, owe, you owe us more. And so people were really, really frustrated, especially if they were from uh, originally from rebelling t tribes. And that was one of their downfalls um, when the Spanish came because the city states that felt that they had the inequality, um, that they were poorer than they should be, sided with the Spanish because they thought the Spanish would treat them better. And Ooh, so big mistake, big mistake, right? <laughs> no, they didn't, right? Obviously they didn't, but yeah. they thought that the Spanish would. And so it, 
because of the Aztec inequality, taxation inequality, um, they that was kind of their downfall with the, the conquering Spaniards. If they if their populace had felt more secure, they definitely would not have been taken down by the Spanish. Although there is the, the case of the smallpox killing about 90% of the population. But um but that Besides they that. Were, <laughs> besides that, um, yeah. the Spanish ha didn't have the military force that the Aztecs did. Uh, so, um, but when you're saying that, Vanessa, they didn't have the numbers. The Aztecs had more numbers, but their uh, weapons mm -hmm. were superior, and that's why they actually mm -hmm. their their messages were sorry. Their weapons were superior, and also their mentality was to capture and kill. So, in one of the ceremonies of the Aztecs, all of the the hierarchy, as you're saying, they were all dancing, and so it was very easy for the Spanish to gather them together and and do away with them. So it's about mentality as well. The Aztecs were never believed that they would be conquered. Mm. Yes, and that was one thing I learned that they didn't have metal. The Aztecs didn't have metal where the Spanish did. Um, and I, my husband was t telling me that the Spanish had gotten the technology from the Chinese, and so they had perfected the steel only only semi recently. But the Aztecs used obsidian, which is basically molten glass and is still used today in eye surgery because it's evidently very precise. Um, but they didn't have metal. They hadn't, they hadn't um, perfected the technology of metal. Well, we need to do a little more research on the Aztecs, but as I, I was saying that um, because I'm studying the ancient civilizations in Egypt, it, it mentions the Aztecs a little bit, but it's such a huge body of information that it would take a long time. My question is, did you like, our, our, this is fairy tale flip. So I'm wondering, and I love the fact that we're taking something from another culture. I love the fact that we've both done the research as much as possible to find out what was going on behind the construction of this le legend. And I'm wondering if you like now having done a legend or if you really prefer doing folklore and fairy tales. And I'll give you my answer after I hear yours. <laughs> um, I thought it was a nice change. I think it was interesting to look at the history of the people um, because like we were saying before, a fairy tale it doesn't isn't rooted to a time, it's not rooted to a place. So it's more about the, the meaning of the story Whereas this one, there was a lot more history of the people and um, what what their story meant to them. Um, so I thought it was a nice change. I like having a focus on fairy tales, but I don't mind doing a, a, a legend once in a while. What about you? What were your thoughts? Well, I, I agree with everything you're saying. This is a legend that talks about pride and unity. And usually in fairy tales, we don't get that. <laughs> we don't mm -hmm. have... Names usually, um, and in Hans Christian Andersen, it was another thing with the two that we were considering. There were names where usually you don't have names in fairy tales because they're more ethereal, they're more general. I mm -hmm. still like the the social commentaries in fairy tales. And even as I'm saying that, I realize that it's going to be in the end, many of similar social commentaries. And so it really mm -hmm. is nice now that I'm now that we're talking about it. <laughs> That we've Talking taken theories. a little side, you know, a little side trip into legends because it, it was nice. I've been to Mexico City. I didn't know anything about the volcanoes. Nobody talked about it. or mm. And I think it would have been fascinating to know this whole legend when I was there. So It gives more meaning, right? When you see a volcano and you have a legend around that story, that, that volcano, it, you want to know it and understand it better. Like, it, I feel like having these these stories really helps us to connect and i love that about um uh about this legend i've never been in mexico city but i will for sure be very interested in seeing these these volcanoes um at this time i i live in texas so we border mexico so i've been to a lot of the the border towns but i've never been to mexico central Right, right. It's very different. It's very different. Although, you know, all of Latin America does is much more influenced by the United States than, for instance, European countries in Spain. But mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, I, maybe we need to do this. Pretend that we're going on a trip and pick a legend from each country. So, <laughs> well, and I and, think sometimes it's easier um, 
since we were trying to be intentional in picking stories and fairy tales from different countries, it makes it a little bit more difficult for us to do that uh, and be strict with staying with a fairy tale. And um, and so I, I think that it's I think it's fine, especially when we're when we're dealing with um, countries outside of our realm of knowledge. Yeah, I agree with that. And I'd love to even branch out into Greek myths, because what I'm finding out from this study of Chem, which is now known as Egypt, is that the Greek myths, actually, all of them have not just a grain, but, um, you know, big uh, balls of truth in them. And they're now considered you know, the, the gods, the Greek gods, and they're considered these sort of fantastical stories. And yet they all have a lot of truth in ancient history. So let's see, let's think about going there as well. Yeah, that, uh, that's definitely interesting. The Greek mythology is uh, really fascinating. We listen in the car, uh, my children, especially my eight-year-old loves the Greeking Out podcast. I don't know if you're familiar with that because it's, it's aimed at children, but it's very educational and it's really fun in the way he tells stories. So um, for any listener who's interested in, in learning the story of Greek mythology with your children, it's I definitely recommend the Greeking Out podcast. It's, oh, it sounds wonderful. Sounds it's wonderful. Really, yeah, it's really, yeah, it's really fun. Even for me, I enjoy listening to them uh, over. Uh, I mean, I don't even mind if we listen to the same episode over and over again. <laughs> so oh, before we go, I had one other question, but I want to make sure to remind people that if you're enjoying this podcast, make sure you're hitting subscribe so that you get our notifications when we do this monthly podcast and that you are aware when we uh, do our lives. So make sure you hit that subscribe button and you can follow along um, on also, you can listen on my podcast, uh, Fabric of Folklore. I, I put it up on, on, as an audio version as well. But I did want to, someone asked me recently on my page um, what the fairy tale flip stood for. And because I came in after you'd already named the, the podcast, I wanted to, to ask you where that name came from. Well, part of it is just alliteration, fairy tale flip, and we were actually the full title was fairy tale flip fi Fridays. We we're going to do it the first month Friday of every month, and it was simply taking a fairy tale and turning it, flipping it on its side, and seeing what was underneath the what we see on the surface. Mm -hmm. um, what exactly what we're doing here, Vanessa, is taking something that seems so simple and so straightforward, and showing how there's a lot of meaning behind it, and when the writers or the villagers or whomever put the legend together because it really does have a progression. There's a lot behind that we, we inherently understand, but what you and I are doing is bringing it to the surface. So mm -hmm. we're flipping the fairy tale and then, and examining the underbelly of it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's how I described it as well. And she was like, she said, maybe also, is it the flip side of the different versions? And I said, yes, that as well. That, there you that's, go also um part of it so very good yeah the explanation and so this we're coming to the end but we really want to encourage our listeners to you know give us their comments give us uh, their suggestions of you know what did you think about our our topic today what did you like doing a legend or do you want us most primarily to stick with fairy tales um what what do you like about either one uh, we want to hear from you about all of these things do you um what did you get from the story we we love hearing from our audience members so we really uh encourage your conversation after the fact and then we also encourage you to tell us what stories you want us to do for next month do you have any ideas about what you were thinking about for next month donna well, we can always consider the two hands Grants to Anderson fairy tales that we didn't talk about today. Or we can go to Greek myths. Or we can look, you know, in a different continent and pick another legend. Or we can, mm -hmm. you know, use one of those for the three choices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I'd like if, to try another legend because just what you're saying, it's, it was really interesting delving in a little bit of the history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. So if you have um, a suggestion, we want to hear what fairy tale or legend you want to hear from, hear about, and comment down below if you're watching on YouTube, um, or comment on my Facebook page. We would love to hear from you. So do we have any last minute, last uh, thoughts, Donna? 
My last thought is um, when you're reading a legend, first feel it, just enjoy it as much as you can, and then pick out the little nuggets that you'd like to know more about and do a little research or write down questions and send them to me or Vanessa and we will explore yeah. them. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining us on Fairy Tale Flip, Episode 5. And we can't wait uh, to do this again with you next time, next month. Thank you so much, Vanessa. It's been so much fun as usual. <laughs>